Hi, I'm Barry Ostrowski. At Barnabas Health, we believe citizens need to be informed about the important health care issues affecting their lives. That's why we're proud to support health care programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners on public television. Funding for A Conversation with Governor Chris Christie and Steve Adubato has been provided by PSE&G, the law firm of Gibbons PC, TD Bank, NJ Best, United Water, Barnabas Health, Cone Resnick, Qualcare Inc., and by these public-spirited organizations committed to informing New Jersey citizens about the issues that matter. Promotional support provided by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association and its monthly magazine, New Jersey Business. And by NJ.com, small news, big news, true Jersey. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. Welcome to the Tisch WNET studio here in the heart of New York City. It's my honor, my pleasure to introduce the governor of the great state of New Jersey, Governor Chris Christie. You can tell that there is an audience here in uh, New York at the Tisch WNET studio. Governor, I want to thank you for joining us. We're here for the next hour. You can tweet your comments. You can go online at NJ. Com. The show is being streamed there. We're being seen in WNET, NJ uh, TV as well, Fios after the fact, and also a little bit later on on WABC radio. Um, Governor, I got to ask you, I know there are pressing issues about Cuba. There are issues about uh, horrific situations involving our police and a whole range of other matters. But a whole range of folks on social media, NJ.com, Fios and other places wanted to know, as I was watching, we're taping this show on the 22nd, of uh, December. I happen to be a giant fan. Yeah. I know you are not. No. For the second week in a row, I saw you in the Jerry Jones Dallas Cowboy box. Yes, sir. You were in what I thought was an orange sweater. You assured me it was, excuse me, I read, you assured me it was orange. Mm -hmm. It was my TV, apparently. <laughs> what is the deal with you and Dallas and Jerry Jones? Please clarify. Sh sure. Um, uh, ever since I've been nine years old, I was a Dallas Cowboys fan. Uh, starting back in Super Bowl V, I saw Roger Staubach play for the first time. I thought, this is a guy I want to root for, so I started rooting for the Cowboys. I've been a Cowboys fan ever since, through really good years and through really bad years. And when I ran in 2009, I got asked about what my favorite football team was. I said it was the Dallas Cowboys. And uh, it was, is, and, and will be. You know, change your sports teams, you know? So um, that's who I am. And I've become friends with Jerry over the last five years. Jerry. Yeah, Jerry. I, 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 he allows me to call him Jerry. I don't call him Mr. Jones. Um, calls me, I call him Jerry. And I've become friends with Jerry over the last five years. And, um, you know, we were at the game together in Philadelphia two weeks ago. Sure. And then Mary Pat and myself and all the children went down to Dallas this weekend. And we went to the game yesterday. And you have no intention of becoming a Giant fan or a Jeff fan anytime soon, even though you have a relationship with Rex Ryan, who by the time this show airs after the fact may or may not be the coach. But that's all right. Come on. I mean, let's not let's not have a premature I, no, I, funeral I, I, for Rex. No, I know he's a great guy. He's a he's wonderful a great, guy. He's, he's a great my friend. Coach. He's my friend. Don't say that. But about why aren't you a Jeff? Don't talk about my friend being fired. That's not right. I, I didn't mean it that way. He's a great coach, he's and he'll a, be hired. Yes, and I and, and and if the Jets fire him, it's a big mistake. We we would agree. Um, Want to move from sports? I don't care. Okay. It's your show. That won't last long. Um, <laughs> Governor, um, there is no easy transition to do this, but, but I want to talk about Cuba. And the Cuba, Cuban situation has become incredibly fascinating and controversial on a lot of levels. The president uh, clearly made a historic decision, an executive decision. Many in Congress, including United States Senator Bob Menendez, who we just had on in a special with Cory Booker, Bob Menendez made his feelings clear about how he disagreed with the president regarding the Cuba situation and the agreement. But you went further and wrote a letter and basically said that the Cuban agreement reached by the United States is problematic largely because a woman by the name of Joanne Chesimard, um, who now goes by the name of Sada Shakur, 
1973, was convicted of killing a New Jersey state trooper, escaped to Cuba, has been in Cuba for a long period of time, as we believe. And you said what in that letter as it relates to the agreement in terms of her being extradited back to the United States for killing a state trooper? Well, in my mind, it's unacceptable to have uh, a reopening of diplomatic relations with Cuba and unacceptable to even consider taking them off the terrorist watch list uh, if they are harboring a convicted cop killer. And let's remember, that's what Joanne Chesimard is. She murdered in cold blood a New Jersey state trooper on the side of the road who was just doing his job. That family has lived with that pain and that loss now for 41 years. And for the last 30 years, this woman has been granted political asylum by the government of Cuba, been paid by the governor of Cuba, and she is a convicted cop killer. So what I said to the president was there should be no reopening of these relations and no um, uh, consideration taking them off the terrorist watch list because his own FBI, the president's own FBI, has her in the top 10 most wanted domestic terrorists. Uh, yet there's been no conversation that anyone's aware of regarding sending her back to complete her sentence. And remember, she used violence also, took prison guards hostage right. to escape in 1979. Governor, right before we came on the air, Associated Press put out a story from officials in Cuba who basically said, um, absolutely not. And I know you read it. Uh, basically, Associated Press reported that Josefina Vidal, representing the Cuban government, has said that um, every nation has sovereign and legitimate rights to grant political asylum to people it considers to have been persecuted. That's a legitimate right. They have said that there is no extradition agreement between the United States and Cuba. And they're wondering, who are you, Chris Christie, to be asking this? The president is not asking for it. So my question to you is this. What pressure will you be putting on the president to ask for Joanne Chesimar to be returned? And have you heard anything from the White House on this? Well, first off, I think it's very interesting, the quote you used. She said that every sovereign nation has the right to grant asylum to people who have been persecuted. So Joanne Chesimar, a cold-blooded cop killer, convicted by a jury of her peers in what is, without question, the fairest and most just criminal justice system in the world, certainly much more just than anything that's happened in Cuba under the Castro brothers, she's now according to a, an official of the Cuban government, persecuted. Was the president wrong in not asking for this? The president was wrong in not asking for it. And the president is getting his proof right now through that comment. Remember, the president said this is going to change things in Cuba, this opening up. And another thing she said in that story that she didn't mention was that she said, we're happy to accept the entire package the president has offered. Well, what did the United States get? And more importantly, what did those people who are persecuted and whose human rights are violated in Cuba get in return for America now opening up its economic and travel doors and full diplomatic relations with the power and the, and the majesty that that has to have an American embassy in your country? Was it a bad deal? It was an awful deal. And it is typical of this president, unfortunately, in negotiations. The Iranian nuclear deals extended six months at a time over and over and over again while they continue to move towards a nuclear capability. Now, we normalize relations with Cuba without getting anything in return. We have a hostage exchange, and that's what we get in return. Uh, we, for 50 years, have demanded that they have free elections, that they open the Internet, that they allow political prisoners to be released. None of those things mm -hmm. happen. We're just going to take that on the come, I guess. Um, listen, what I'm going to do is do what I need to do as governor of New Jersey, which is one of our state troopers was murdered in cold blood. His killer was convicted. And these thugs in Cuba have given her political asylum for 30 years. It's unacceptable. And I'm going to continue to speak out. I don't know whether I'll put any pressure on the president or not, but I'm certainly going to continue to speak out. Governor, unfortunately, there's a direct connection. We talk about that state trooper who was killed in 1973. We talk about the fact that right here in New York City, um, two of the bravest uh, police officers killed sitting in their car, assassinated, if you will, right? 
As a former United States attorney, you've prosecuted cases involving police officers involved in these kinds of situations. Rudy Giuliani, who is very supportive of you, a former U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York, former presidential candidate, has spoken out loudly on this. Rudy Giuliani has said <clears throat> that the mayor of New York City, Mayor de Blasio, as well as Al Sharpton, have created an environment that in many ways has contributed, they have contributed to open season on cops and an environment where um, cops are now more vulnerable than ever before. Was he right? Well, I'll tell you this. One of the things that disturbs me about the entire conversation that we're having right now is that it seems like lots of people um, are trying to score political points here. And what I'm thinking about as we sit three days away from Christmas are those two families of those two police officers who will not have them at their dinner table at Christmas time, who won't have them there to open up the presents under the Christmas tree, who will not have them, not only just this Christmas, but every Christmas from now on going forward. And I think before we get into all of that analysis, it may be time for everybody in this region and around the country to take a deep breath and to think about the loss that's been suffered by these two families and take some time out to pray for them and for their families. And I, and I think the rest of it, there's plenty of time for us to discuss it, but I'm not going to be someone who's going to participate in this at the moment. I'd rather allow these police officers to be laid to rest, let these families grieve, and have all of us as a society mm. think about what that means. Well, Governor, I'm going to try one more on this, and I totally respect and understand where you're coming from, but as a former prosecutor who understands this very well, and also as a governor who ran and got a very large percentage of the black and Latino vote to work very hard in black churches in the black community to gain trust. Here's my question. What do you believe needs to be done to try to strengthen what is clearly a strained and difficult and painful and unhealthy relationship between many in the black community and the police department? Well, Not I just in New York City, but in New Jersey as well. Sure. Well, listen. I think less talking and more doing of? of this. Let's look in Camden for a minute, Steve, um, where we have worked incredibly hard, the state and the county and the local government, to reestablish uh, law and order in Camden, but to do it in a way where the community feels empowered. And so if you look at what's happened in Camden over the last two years, murders are down 58 percent with the new police force that we put in effect, the county police force that has a metro division that covers Camden, 400 police officers on the street there. And just this week, you had Camden police officers dressed as Santa Claus going door to door in some of the most underprivileged neighborhoods in Camden and giving out gifts that they had collected to those children and those underprivileged families. They want to make the community a part of the law enforcement community, and they want to build trust and respect between the citizens and themselves, and the citizens are participating in that and benefiting. And I think the model that we've established here in Camden could be a model that folks consider you around really the country. believe in Newark, where the federal government actually has taken over the police department, and in other places, you, and in New York City, because people care what you say nationally, Governor. You know that as well as I do. You believe the Camden model has the potential? I absolutely do. And listen, remember, Camden, for a number of years, was considered and ranked the most dangerous city yes. in America. So if it can work in Camden, yeah, I think it can okay. work anywhere. Okay. Um, Sony, I promise we'll do pension reform. We'll do uh, a whole bunch of other New Jersey stuff. Um, the president said that Sony capitulated and folded on the movie, The Interview, all right? And they shouldn't have. Just, can I get a yes or no? Did Sony fold unnecessarily? Yes. If Sony wanted to say, we're hanging in there, we're not going to let the North Koreans tell us what to do, First Amendment right, we're doing this, we're not going to, okay. Would you, as governor, if they wanted to show this in a New Jersey movie, let's say they're movie theaters, right? But we need protection because we have to protect the people who go, governor. Would you have said, you know what? We're going to back you up with state troopers, state police. Because they were afraid, obviously, for liability and for the safety of 
of people who would go, which makes sense. Certainly we would have worked with law enforcement, whether it was local, county, or state, or some combination of those, if there was a verified threat, which we would do now no matter what. If there's a verified threat in some other area of the state, we bring in the resources that are necessary to keep people safe, and this would be no different. The cyber thing is different, isn't it? You've seen it before. Well, yeah, but I, no, I don't think it's different. You don't think it's different? No, listen, it's, it's another one of the evolving threats that we face in the world, unfortunately. We have to know the nature of our adversary, and we need to react accordingly. And I thought it was interesting to have the president say, well, Sony never called me. I, I don't know. You know, maybe it's just different ways of approaching a problem, but certainly we're briefed, mm. and he certainly was briefed about the attack. Yes. Um, it seems to me it's the obligation of the president of the United States to call them and say, okay, everybody in the White House, let's get together. Let's see how we're going to react to this. And, and then you can give those kind of assurances uh, regarding safety and security and the rest. And that the president has even more of an ability to provide than, than a governor. So I think there were a lot of mistakes here. I think Sony made a mistake by backing off. And I think, quite frankly, the president made a mistake by not being assertive okay. and being, getting everybody into the White House from Sony and the movie theater companies that Sony was complaining about and the intelligence community and say, okay, what's the nature of the threat? Explain the nature of the threat. And what can we do to stop it? Is there a safe way to show this movie around the country um, without putting people's lives unnecessarily in danger? And, and that's what a leader does. If you have uh, just tuned in, we're with uh, Governor Chris Christie. This is live. We're at the uh, Tisch WNET studio here in New York City. We're uh, being seen on WNET, NJTV. We're uh, also streaming on NJ.com and being uh, listened to later on uh, WABC, Fios One News as well, W. Uh, WHYY in Philadelphia, you know we're all over the place, right? It's WBGO, yep. WABC uh, Radio, but also uh, our partners at 88.3, right? Jazz? You love jazz. Except you. No, not really. Just go along. I mean, not really. I'm a Will one. You of, stop. But, just, but why would I? Why would I, I, I but that's right, Dallas. You, you got you to be consistent. Listen, I listen to what I listen to. I'm, I'm not Miles a, Davis, no? I'm not a big jazz fan. I admire it as an art form. I'm not a big jazz fan. I don't listen to it. All right, much. question Springsteen, Billy Joel. Springsteen. Bon Jovi, Springsteen. Well, that's a little different. Um, because uh, he's been very supportive of you, John Bon Jovi. No, well, because John's a friend, and I, and I like John a lot, and he's also an outstanding artist and a great representative in New Jersey. I love them both. Um, I think I've had a longer history in listening to Bruce's music. Did you not do the, the ice bucket challenge with John Bon Jovi? Yes, I did. I dumped the ice bucket water right on John. Did that bring you closer together? No. <laughs> it did not. Okay, back to serious. But it, but, but it was nice of him to have me do it. Okay. NJ.com. You follow NJ.com. This is Star Ledger's website. And they had some wonderful questions. You ready for one? I see you are. Um, governor, pensions. Uh, the question on NJ.com was, Governor, when you ran, you talked about reforming the pension system, getting it right. A lot of fanfare having to do with the Democrats and Republicans coming together. Yeah. We actually interviewed uh, my colleague, Rafael Piermont, who I have great respect for, uh, Capital Report. We actually had Steve Sweeney, the president of the Senate. He said on our show, as it follows up this NJ.com question, he said we had a great deal with the governor to close the pension gap, to fund it, and Sweeney told Rafael and I on Capital Report, the governor broke the promise, and he always thought you were a guy that would keep your promises, and he was shocked. Please explain. Now, listen, I, the fact is that unless Steve um, comes up with a way to print money... Um, you mean the, the Senate president? Well, I call him Steve. Okay. Um, uh, unless Steve comes up with a way to print money, he knows full well, nor did the Democrats ever come forward with a plan that would have fully made the pension payment. And so, you know... Explain to folks the whole thing, like... Well, uh, listen, the fact of the matter is, the pension today... Of public employees. Of public employees, teachers, police officers, firefighters, other government workers... It's broke. It, no, first of all, there are $70 billion in assets on deposit today, mm -hmm. $70 billion in assets, with a B, to pay these pensions. This pension system is in much better shape today because of the deal that we made in 2011. The much better shape. Bipartisan compromise. Right, that we made in 2011 that would have been if we had not made it. 
And yes, we were not able to make the full payment that we hope to make in this most recent budget year, the one we're in right now. Um, but it's simply because we didn't have the money. And there was no plan that was put forward, that could be put forward, um, that was going to come up with the money to do it. And so we paid all of the payment that needed to be made for that year. What we didn't pay was the money that hadn't been paid by all the previous governors. With all that being said, we've paid in my administration, in five budgets, $2.9 billion into the pension program, which is more than any governor has put in in history. And so, listen, Steve um, has to play politics at times. I understand that. So you don't um, think he actually believes that you broke a promise? No, he understands the fact that we, we, because by the way, this budget that I passed without the full pension payment in it was passed by the state legislature. By the Democrats? Yes, and sent to my desk. But he did say uh, at a business and industry association forum, I happened to moderate with the legislative leaders last week, he said publicly again that he said one of the ways to fund the pension, if you were willing to support it, was an increase in the millionaire's tax. Right. Which... And if you supported an increase in the millionaire's tax, meaning those who earn a million dollars or more, Governor, that, I don't know, is it $600 million would come in of additional revenue, and that money could go directly into funding the pension. And he said that would go a long way, but the governor says no. No, well, first off, because unfortunately, um, Steve and many Democrats like him um, have never met a tax that they don't like to increase. And the fact is that folks who make a lot of money in this state pay more in taxes than all people at that level, with the exception of one of two other states. Uh, in the country. And as a result, New Jersey continues to have challenges with those folks moving out of our state and taking with them the jobs and the small businesses that they create. Everybody doesn't mind taxes being raised on other people. They don't like them raised on them. Mm. Um, fact is, what we've done in the last five years is to hold taxes steady in this state. Uh, and I'm going to continue to make sure that we do that. And the fact is that a, the person who earns the median income here in New Jersey, the median income, the middle class, pays lower taxes on their income than any other state in the country. And so I'm trying to make sure that we continue to protect that kind of distinction. And I'm not going to, you know, go for higher income taxes. No and way. by the way, no, no way. And by the way, the $600 million that they're talking about raising, which is, by the way, optimistic, but let's just give them the $600 million, still would only pay half of, a half of. But it would help. Of, yeah. Well, you know what? And the hurt that it would do on the other side of the equation to the state's economy would do much more damage to the people of this state. There are ways we can get this fixed. We should continue to work on getting it mm. fixed together. I continue to look forward to working with them on getting it fixed. But, you know, that kind of stuff at those kind of forums uh, that Steve participates in, you know, sometimes folks, all folks in politics, play to the audience. Um, it's my job to make sure that I tell people the truth. Um, real quick on this. Uh, revenue projections. You know, you talk to the folks in the legislature, they have their folks who say... This is how much money is coming in, how much revenue is coming in. You have your folks on the Treasury side saying, this is how much money coming, is coming in. They're never the same numbers. But you have to propose a budget based on the numbers that are certified and you believe are the numbers. Right. Does it matter to you, Governor, that the, the bond houses, the folks who are looking at this stuff, have downgraded our credit several times because they're arguing that they're questioning the stability of the state budget. Does that bother you at all? No, because these are the same people who got us into the financial mess in 2008 and 2009 by not telling people the truth, and now they're trying to make it up for it. So that's one problem. So I don't think they have a whole lot of credibility, and I think their track record and all the people who have sued them prove that they don't have a lot of credibility. But secondly, um, we also have a situation where the credit problems that they're talking about have been stuff that's been developed over 15 years in the state that we're the ones who are taking the course towards fixing. For instance, our budget in fiscal year 2015 spends less money in actual dollars than we spent in fiscal year 2008, seven years ago. Now, that kind of fiscal discipline hasn't been seen in New Jersey in a long time. Through what? Cutting? Yeah, and main cutting, maintaining, reducing the number of state employees that we have, getting rid of unnecessary programs. We've done all those things and been criticized for many of them by Democratic members of the legislature who all want to have their cake and eat it, too. Can't do that. And so we won't do it. And uh, we're not going to. So the credit downgrade stuff is inside baseball and nothing that I'm concerned about uh, at Real all. quick, because we're going to take a quick break, just because we're breaking this up into two half hours. 
Um, give me two minutes on Atlantic City and I know you're disappointed in the results there because I've heard you say it before because you really wanted to see a renaissance there and uh, with the Revel situation and everything else, you're not happy with that. Well, I think we, I, no. Well, of course, I'm never happy when anybody loses their job. And what matters to me the most is not the number of casinos or all the rest of that. What matters to me is that every casino that closes, people lose their jobs. Is it four right now or is it? Listen, what's going to happen over the course of time uh, is there were 13 casinos in Atlantic City in a very small. Too many? Well, of course, because they were built during a period of time when we had a monopoly on casino gaming east of the Mississippi. There are now 40 states that offer casino gaming. Well, by the very nature of competition, a city that's built on a monopoly and doesn't change, when the monopoly is broken, will no longer be viable. So I think we'll get down to a smaller number of casinos. I'm not going to predict how many. But I think it's a natural right-sizing of the city in terms of gaming. What we've been trying to do over the last few years and had real success at is increasing the non-gaming revenue, which has gone up every year since we put our plan into effect. And we got a lot more work to do. But in the meantime, while that right sizing goes on, um, it is gonna be painful. Uh, and we have to understand that. But one last thing, the casino gaming revenue in 2013, Atlantic City, was $2.5 billion. Now that is down from six years ago at a high of 5.2 billion. But at $2.5 billion, it is the second highest gaming revenue state in America behind Nevada. Wouldn't sports betting make it even better? Well, it would, and that's why I fought for sports gaming, continue to fight in court to get sports gaming uh, win legalized. It? I don't know whether we're going to win or not. I hope we're going to win. I'm confident that we're right. And you had the commissioner of the NBA today calling on me to join him to legalize gaming across the nation. Well, then, Mr. Commissioner, withdraw your lawsuit, and let's start by legalizing it in New Jersey. And if other states want to legalize it, we're happy to compete. But I think it's kind of crazy for the commissioner of the NBA to say, uh, through one, on one hand, uh, join me, governor, and let's have legalized sports gaming everywhere, but not in New Jersey right now. You think it's inconsistent and hypocritical? Well, I, I don't. I, I, you put words in my mouth. I think. Well, you put. What, what, no, what I, do you didn't, call I did not use the word hypocritical well, or inconsistent. What I would call it, quite frankly, is a bait and switch. Um, you're, you're, you come over here and work with me on the federal government side to try to get something passed through Congress. That's been really successful lately. Get something passed through Congress, but in the meantime, you wait. And we're going to go to the courts to stop And we're going to continue to have our injunction courts. against you. Yes. So if Adam Silver believes that sports gaming is okay, then allow sports gaming in New Jersey, allow mm -hmm. us to be the model like we were with Nevada on casino gaming, and then yeah. as other states want to join in, New Jersey will not object to other states coming first, in. though. Well, I'd like to be next. Okay, one more quickie on this before we go to the break. Uh, some of our the folks that we know want to have a casino, legalized gambling in northern New Jersey, and you say... We'll see. Come on, you never hold back on these things. Sports... I hold back all the time if I don't have the answer. What would be wrong I don't, with that? Listen, I don't, I don't answer questions just because you ask them. Huh? If I don't have an answer, I'm not giving you one. The answer is we'll see. But you're, you're, that would be a great idea for those up in the Meadowlands area. It would do good things for them, a lot of folks say. The county executive in Essex County, Joe DiVincenzo, says it would be great for the economy up there. Some Bergen County legislators say it would be great for the economy. You say? We'll see. Okay, on that note, um, why don't we do this, Governor? Could you just sit there? I'm going to take a quick break. Come right back. It, it, whatever you want. Great. The governor's with us for the entire hour. We're here at the Tisch WNET studios here on 66th and Broadway, but we're being seen all throughout the uh, tri-state area and beyond on WNET, NJTV, NJ.com, Fios, uh, listen a little bit uh, later on WABC uh, 77 Radio. Listen, folks, the governor is uh, telling us everything he thinks. Stay with us. We'll be right back. To see applaud. our programs online, visit us at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. Welcome to the Tisch WNET studio here in uh, New York City. We are here with Governor Chris Christie in front of a live audience. You can prove it here, folks, in front of a live audience. They're enthusiastic. Yes. Halfway through the program, they're still That's applauding. That's pretty good. That's good. We're doing um, well. Governor, let's do this. We have a question from uh, Fios. Uh, folks in Fios are asking, talk, uh, let me try this one. 
This FIOS question was about legalizing marijuana. Mm -hmm. Now, you've had a very interesting set of positions. Actually, recently you just talked about this. You are not a big fan when it comes to um, criminalizing folks who have drug problems. You want them to get treatment. Correct. Legalize marijuana? No. Because the fact is that we've seen over and over again in more recent studies that marijuana is a gateway drug to other more serious drugs, that marijuana does serious damage to the brain, and it is not the type of thing that I think we need to see in the state of New Jersey. That is very different from talking about someone who now has the disease well, why of addiction it? because it's a crime. That's why you criminalize it. The federal government says that marijuana is a drug that is not legal in the United States. Now, I understand this is another place where the Obama administration talks out of both sides of its mouth. But, you know, they let certain states legalize now, yet they still say on the federal level they have DA agents doing marijuana cases every day. Um, we like consistency in New Jersey, and the fact is, it makes no sense in my mind to legalize marijuana, and as long as I'm the governor of the state of New Jersey, we will not. Okay. Uh, governor, clearly, um, and this program will air as it's airing live right now, but it will repeat later on. Um, it may be repeating after you make it clear publicly what your intentions are uh, with respect to the presidential campaign. Could you let, let folks know here in the audience, but more here in New York, but also across the region watching and online as well? What will you base your decision on? Three things. Is it right for me? Is it right for my family? Is it right for the country? If I answer yes to- In what to order? Me, my family, the country. And if I answer yes to all three of those things, then I'll run. And if I don't answer yes to all three, I won't. How much, if at all, does it matter to you that your good friend and someone you respect a great deal, Jeb Bush, has made it clear that he looks like he may run? It's not one of the three questions. Okay, so um, here's the thing, the presidential thing. Uh, you know, again, we're Jersey guys, and, you know, um, you a bit more assertive than some of us. Uh, <laughs> you know. Uh, That's what I've heard. I've seen the video. Um, and I know you personally, and I, and, and, and I always find your personality fascinating. And you get, a, you get a reaction from people, let's just say that. So here's the question on demeanor. In many ways, it's your calling card. It's how you get stuff done. But there are some who say, hey, I don't know, is it presidential? Here's my question. If you decide to run for president, and this show will air if the governor decides in January or February, this will be a really good show and we'll milk it, trust me, we'll just keep repeating it. <laughs> <sighs> stuff happens out on the presidential trail. It happens in New Jersey, so everyone's following you. Here's my question. Things happen, and a reaction is easily gotten in tense situations. Do you have any intention of doing anything to tone down, mute, do anything to alter your demeanor? No. Why would I? It's who I am. I mean, you know, if, if people want somebody different than, than if I ever ran for president, then they'd vote for somebody different. But I... I, I don't intend to become a phony to win an election. I didn't say phony. Well, if I'm not acting like who I am, that's what I would call you. I'm not going to, you know. Which is probably part of the demeanor thing. Well, here's the thing. And we've had some. You all characterize it. You all in the media. Don't, 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 it. don't put me yeah, on with the media. You're, you're part of the media, and that's the way you guys characterize it. You love, you know, this conversation. N no, I. Every, no matter where I go, you know, you all, not the public. Because when I'm with the public, they never ask me about this. Let me try it differently. Go ahead. All of us, now I feel like Dr. Phil, which is not a good thing. Um, all of us try to tweak, modify, change wherever we think we can be better. Well, my question is this. We were running a promo to get people to watch the show, and you had this really great spot where this guy was holding up some sign and being really irritating, and you said, sit down and shut up. And we're right. like, we have to put that in there. Sure. Because that'll get people to watch. I heard you say I after you that. a lot about the motivation of the media, but okay. <laughs> Governor, you said it. It was great video, and you said afterwards that 
you wouldn't have done anything differently because the guy was being ridiculous, you said. Correct. Okay, so here's my question. Are there times that you say to yourself, you know what, maybe there was a different way to handle that. That's what I'm getting at. Well, not that you change your personality. Everybody says, I mean, I don't think That's all a, I'm asking. Well, that's not all you're asking because what, what you'll now do. you become a different person. What you'll do and what others will do with that piece of tape is you will take the small piece of whatever I say and then you will use that to say, see, Christy now says he will change. I would do that? Yes, you would. The same way in the promo, I'm sure that you only showed the sit down and shut up part. There is a, there is a Governor, 90. Governor, we saw you laughing and there, smiling about there, Springsteen there is and so many other parts second, of that. There is a 90 second run into that where I let that guy. You did. Yell, go on, block the cameras with his signs, speak over me, get booed by the crowd. All true. And I say nothing except continue to try to give my speech. But what the media typically does is show the last five seconds, which when I finally get to the point where people are booing, people are upset, we need to move on, this person's making a rude spectacle of themselves, I say, now, sit, I'll, I, and what I said was, I'm happy to talk to you alone later, but until then, sit down and shut up. And I don't regret that for one second. And I wouldn't change that part of myself. But what you all like to do is to take that small part and say, look at him. All someone had to do was set, stand up and say something, and bang, he out says, sit down and shut up. Not only out of context, um, but it's to make the point that you make, because people like to watch that. So you say, okay, well, people like to watch it. They want to watch this program tonight, so let's show the five seconds of Christie rather than the bigger part. That's the part of the game, and that's the business that I'm in, but and I understand that. But it's a whole hour of you unedited, Governor, but, right now. Well, that's right, and I don't think they've seen me punch you yet. But... Um, <laughs> But they live in hope, um, given the, see, given, see, you know, given the promo that you showed. So the, my only point to you is that uh, if the question is, if you're asking me, do I all the time... Especially in a presidential campaign, because things get crazy. especially in a presidential campaign. It's no different. You don't think so? No. Listen, people try to egg you on in a gubernatorial campaign. They'll try to egg you on in a, in a presidential campaign. It's just the way it goes. But the, the, the thing that, that often folks in the media make the mistake of is, and, and Matt Lauer asked me this on his program, you have to control yourself more when you run for president. I saw that today. My show. answer to him was, what makes you think I wasn't under control? What makes you think that wasn't exactly what I wanted to do? It may not be what you would do, but it's what I would do. And you know what I think the most important thing is when you're deciding to vote for someone? Do you know them? Who are they? Are they trying to fool you, or are they giving you who they are? Nobody thinks I'm trying to fool them. Okay, Governor, um, would you like to move on to another topic? Before Whatever you, you like. Me? I'd be happy to talk about that for as long as you like. No, but you I have... I mean, I'm, I'm happy to do you, it. But you have no desire to get physical with me. I know that. No. No. Why would I? No, but you just... You've been it. kind and generous so far in your question. Um, I'd be happy to continue to have the interplay. Let me bring up another topic. Why not? And see what happens. Let's go. Post-Sandy recovery. You're not happy about it. Um, oh, that's not true. Whoa. Oh. That's not true. You're not happy about it because you see lots of people who are not in their homes, and you're not happy with the pace of it. I heard you say right. it. Listen, I've said that I'm not happy with the pace of home rebuilding. That's much different than saying I'm not happy with the pace of post-Sandy recovery. Post-Sandy recovery. Well, what has listen, gone well, what hasn't? Everything but the home rebuilding has gone at an extraordinarily good okay. pace. And the fact is that on home rebuilding, it's just much more difficult. And the programs Why? have been more difficult to administer because it's much more complex. The federal regulations are enormous. And every home that existed before, before we can rebuild it, has to have a historical significance review, an environmental impact review. All those things are required by our massive over-regulating federal government. And it delays everything that goes on. And then every piece of paper has to be documented. Every piece of paper has to be produced in duplicate to the federal government and HUD. And these are all regulations that have been passed over the period of time by the federal government. And it makes it much, much more difficult. And we made some mistakes. I was going to say, how much of it is on them and how much do you take on your end? On the some of it's end? on us. What? I mean, some of it is on us. I mean, I think the fact is that, um, you know, we had to stand up Billions of dollars of programs um, over a period of time uh, 
that we had never run before. So mistakes are going to totally be made. New. Totally new. No, we never had the second worst natural disaster in American history before. And so, of course, we had to learn things, and we got better over time at doing it. Um, but, uh, and we've made changes that I think have improved the pace of it. And if you talk to people who have dealt with us, we've gotten much better at it. So I'm always looking to improve and get better. But I, I wanted to stop you in the question because if you talk to business people sure. around the state, if you talk to the folks, the infrastructure folks in the state, the rebuilding that we've done to the, the, the destruction that was done in this state has really been, I think, extraordinary. And we've done it in a way with, where we've been underfunded by the federal government, uh, but we've continued to fight and to do the things that we needed to do. And I, would, I think for the overwhelming majority of people who are impacted by Sandy, mm. their lives are back to a new normal. And for those people who aren't, right. we're going to continue to work as hard as we can until they get back to a new normal. I want to ask you about the inheritance tax. There's some people call it the double taxation when you die in the state in just a second. But the, the whole question of Bridgegate, there isn't really much to talk about because it's in the hands of Paul Fishman. He's doing what he's doing. Here's my only question, not about the details of the case at all, not in a position to talk about it clearly. When you look back, is there any part of that where you say, this is an important lesson I learned as a leader? Ask more questions. Don't be as trusting. Even of the closest people to you? Of people who you're relying on to do their job. Yeah. Now, I'm generally a very trusting person. And um, I was too trusting. The whole question of the inheritance tax. You got two taxes, Governor, when you die. I don't know. You know. I don't state know. State tax and inheritance tax. Yeah. So. A state on the dead person, inheritance on the living person. And there is a movement in the state legislature to eliminate the... state tax. Explain that to folks, because New Jersey is one of only a few states one that actually two has... States. One of two states in the country that has both an estate tax and an inheritance tax. It's very expensive to die in this state. Extraordinarily expensive to die in this state. Uh, the death tax here is also well below the federal um, exemption. Uh, you get a $5 million exemption, meaning the first $5 million of your estate is exempt from federal taxes in New Jersey. Now, how much is exempt? $675,000. Now, let me tell you something. For people who own a house in New Jersey, mm -hmm. if they just own their house free and clear and have a little bit of retirement income left over, and remember what happens here. Once you get to $675,000 and $1, the tax isn't on the $1. It's on all six seventy-five. dollars um, was. So this it, doesn't affect rich people. This affects most middle-class families in New Jersey who own their own home. But Governor, um, Assembly Speaker Vincent Prieto, when this issue came up at the Business and Industry Association forum that uh, I was moderating, said, I would like to get rid of it, too. The problem is we reap between 350 and $400 million from this tax. And if we do away with the tax, Someone's got to tell us where we're going to make up the revenue because we already have a bunch of You're shaking your it's, head. It's always, it's always the same story. There's never a tax they want to get rid of, ever, because the way they spend your money is much more important than the way you spend it. I believe it. they, meaning? The Democrats in the legislature, just so we're really clear. So the Republicans have nothing to do with this. No, they're not in the majority. If they were in the majority, we would have repealed the estate tax already. Governor, where would you come up with that money, by the way? You'd cut spending. Any particular program? Yeah, you know, I'm not going to sit here and go through the budget with you, Steve. I've balanced the budget every year for five years. I'd balance it again. All right. I've got uh, NJ.com. I've got Fios. I've got Twitter questions all about the gas tax. Uh -huh. People are concerned about the roads and bridges. The New Jersey Department of Transportation, you read all the studies. I know you know that a very high percentage of our bridges are crumbling, are antiquated, are dangerous, our roads, you know, we don't want to have the Mianas Bridge situation. We all know what happened. God forbid, middle of the night, people don't know what happened. The bridge collapses, people die. No one wants that. It is argued that you and your colleagues in the legislature have a plan. Does that plan potentially include increasing the gas tax in New Jersey, which is the second lowest gas tax in the nation. Why not just, you know what? Nobody wants taxes, but we're going to increase the gas tax. Listen, I have said 
that when I negotiate with the legislature on issues of importance, and this is an issue of importance, how to fund infrastructure, and by the way, just so people are not um, misled by your question, uh, we're spending $3.2 billion a year between federal and state funds in New Jersey to maintain bridges, to maintain roads, to improve mass transit. $3.2 billion a year already. So I don't want people out there who listen to go, oh, we're spending nothing on this stuff and this problem is just so awful. But we're way behind. You, no, they, listen, the whole country is behind, Steve. The whole country is behind. The federal government hasn't passed a highway bill right. in There's a long time. There's an infrastructure time. crisis. There's an infrastructure problem to deal with. And so when I negotiate with the state legislature, I don't do it on live television. I do it in my office behind a closed door, and that's the best way to come to an agreement. And so I'm having discussions with the Senate president, the speaker, and the Republican leaders of the, of the legislature, and I'm hoping that we can come with a solution to the problem. Um, if we can, that's great, and if we can't, we'll have to do something else. But I, I'm, you know, I'm not sitting here in a tizzy over it. No, but a gas tax is possible. I'm not going to sit here and negotiate on live television. Why would I sit here? But you said everything do was on any, the table. Do you have any votes in the legislature? Because if you do, then maybe we could turn that off and you and I can talk about it. But if you don't, negotiating with you, with all due respect, does absolutely nothing for the people of New Jersey. I'll negotiate with the gentlemen who have influence in the legislature. Okay, why don't we talk about... Um, <clears throat> By the way, I just want to remind you we have an audience that the governor is playing to and clearly getting the reaction that he wants. Fine. Um, pipeline. You're up in Canada talking about the Keystone Pipeline. Uh, Twitter question, NJ.com, Files. Everybody wanted to know this, right? Even on my Twitter account. You've got millions of people following you. How about this? They said the governor was up in Canada talking about the Keystone. What is the Keystone Pipeline, by the way? Keystone Pipeline is a pipeline that's been proposed by the TransCanada company to go from... Uh, Canada uh, down to the Gulf Coast of the United States to deliver oil both from Canada and from North Dakota uh, to refineries uh, to be sold and used here in the United States. You like that? Yes, I do. Uh, environmentally dangerous? No. In fact, the president's own State Department has said there's no environmental concerns. The president's own State Department has said there are no environmental concerns. There's another pipeline. Uh, folks are asking about the Pilgrim Pipeline, which is a route, um, it brings crude oil from Albany, New York, to Linda, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. You have not expressed an opinion on that pipeline. Right. Because? Because they haven't put forward their application for the pipeline yet, and they're supporting documents. And so I would be just talking about stuff that was characterized in the newspaper, which for a responsible person is really not the right thing to do. Now, I, do I do know you do not negotiate on live television. Yes. <laughs> and I don't talk about issues that I don't have, you know, information okay. about. So, you know, there's all kinds of people talking about it. They have not even applied for their permits yet to the State Devi Department of Environmental Protection. So it would be wrong for me to express any opinion because it might send a signal one way or another to regulators that would not be appropriate for me to send until we have all the information. So, you know, sometimes... You just have to be responsible. Um, what have I not asked you that I should have asked you? I, mean, I got more, but what have I... Seriously. I'm, I'm, you know, that's not my job. My job here is to answer. If we're going to start getting into me questioning, you need another hour. <laughs> <laughs> At least. All right. How about the national debate about guns? Okay. All right. New Jersey has some of the strictest laws. I mean, I'm not even going to say where it came from on social media because everyone wanted to know your view on... Um, New Jersey's very strict gun laws. Are they strict enough, number one? And if, in fact, you ran for president, would you do anything to try to change the gun laws in this country? Well, first off, um, are, the, are the laws in New Jersey strict enough? Yes. Um, secondly, in terms of the country, if I run for president, I'll certainly be happy to talk about that. But my job right now is here in New Jersey. And in New Jersey, I think the laws are strict enough in terms of uh, the way we handle gun ownership. In fact, they might be a little bit too strict. Too strict? Yeah. For example? Well, I mean, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a difference here in our state. Um, it's much more restricted than most states in terms of ordinary citizens who have absolutely no criminal record at all and their capacity to own a firearm. And, um, but that's something the legislature does not want to deal with. In fact, they want to make their laws even more strict than they are now. So it's an area where you'll probably see no change. A couple quickies. Paid sick leave. 
uh, Newark, Jersey City, my hometown of Montclair, which you love, right? Sure. Um, I love they, all of New Jersey, Steve. I know you love all of New Jersey. Um, we have a lot of towns, right? A lot of school districts. Right? Yes, we do. Um, paid sick leave, the idea that the state would mandate that you get, you get paid. You're sick, you, you know? You don't get a choice if you're an employer. Uh, Vincent Prieto, the assembly speaker, is pushing that whole idea that it should be mandatory. Paid sick leave a good idea? Bad idea. Bad idea. Well, that was quick. Well, when I have an answer to a cogent question, I give it. <laughs> to a co... Yeah. I'm not even going to take the bait. Go ahead, just answer. It's a bad idea. And these towns that are doing it just continue to make New Jersey less and less competitive. And then when businesses leave this state, they want to know why. And the reason is because we make it more and more and more expensive for businesses to do business. That means they can't make money, they don't hire people, and they're going to go places where they can hire people and can make money. Bad idea, Got and it. it's, playing to the, uh, it's playing to the grandstand. Too many standardized tests for kids in school in connection with Common Cause that parents are complaining about, you know, Common Core, excuse me. Um, you know? I have real concerns about Common Core. I set up a commission that's in the midst of, of studying it right now. And I have real concerns about it and the effect it's had on our kids. But we do have to have testing to know where our kids are. Too many tests. I don't know about too many tests, but maybe not the right tests. And we now work on a new test, a park test, that I think will be better than the ASK you test do. that we had before. You do think the park test? I, I said we're working on the park test to see if we can make it a better test than the previous test that we've had. And by better, I mean okay. to give us a better read on how children are actually performing so that we can customize their education to fill their gaps. Got it. Give me one minute on uh, Barack Obama on ISIS. Well, I don't think he thinks it's the JV anymore. He did call it the JV. He did. What do you call him? A terrorist threat that needs to be dealt with. We need to understand the nature of the enemy, and we need to deal with him. How would you deal with him? Well, I'm going to sit here and lay out military strategy. I mean, you know, fact Have you thought is, about it? I, you know, what I've thought about is that we're not clear at all around the world, not just with ISIS, but in other places, um, about the defense of our friends and the way we'll treat our adversaries. And we have a lot of confused people in the world. It's not good to have America sending confusing signals. When you say you're going to draw a red line in Syria, and then they cross the red line, and you don't do anything, that's not a good thing for the world or for our country. Final question. Most important thing you want to accomplish as governor in 2015, because some other things might happen that year for you. I'd like to, I hope we can, we can put the Transportation Trust Fund on a sustainable basis going forward. I hope we can continue to reform the pension and benefit system. I'm hoping we can reduce taxes in a meaningful way for the people of New Jersey. Hoping we can continue to improve education in our urban areas so that no matter what your zip code is, you're going to get a good education that prepares you either for college or for work. And lastly, I hope we continue to see the kind of economic growth we've seen. Our unemployment rate is now down to 6.4%, which is the lowest it's been since 2008. And that's a really good sign for New Jersey, but it's still a bit above the national average, so we still have more work to do. But when I came into office five years ago, the unemployment rate was 10%. 10%. So and now we've done 6.4. We've done pretty well. Where would you like it to be? I'd like it to be at the national average or less. I'm not satisfied there yet. No, but, you know, we've created uh, nearly 150,000 new private sector mm -hmm. jobs in the last five years. And for those 150,000 families, I think they're probably feeling much better tonight than when they weren't working. Yeah, you still love your job, right? Oh, God, yeah, sure. But you're thinking about the other job. Of course. I mean, listen, this job's done in three years. For me, no matter what, I can't run for governor again. Mm. I'm term limited. Um, and I've got to decide what I want to do with the rest of my life. I mean, it's an interesting time for me. I'm 52 years old. Um, you know, uh, you start to think about what do you want to spend the rest of your life doing? Uh, and I've got to make that decision. I'm, and I've said to everybody, I'll make that decision the first part of next year. Um, and if it means pursuing the presidency, um, then we'll do it the same way we've always done everything. And if it doesn't, then we'll finish the job as governor and we'll decide, you know, what we're going to do next to support my family. I mean, I've got a 21-year-old who's a junior in college, an 18-year-old who's a freshman in college, an eighth grader who's 14, and a sixth grader who's 11. I'm working for a while, no matter what. Governor Chris Christie.
I want to uh, I want to remind folks that I want to thank our partners at WNET, NJTV, uh, NJ.com, our partners uh, um, at WABC, uh, FiOS, One News, uh, WBGO, 88.3. Uh, all of our folks, all of our partners who have been with us, has been a great, and thank you very much, Governor. Happy to be here, Steve. The preceding program has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation and NJTV in cooperation with 13 for WNET, WHYY, Fios One News, 77 WABC AM New York, and by WBGO Jazz 88.3 FM. Funding for A Conversation with Governor Chris Christie and Steve Adubato has been provided by PSENG, the law firm of Gibbons PC, TD Bank, NJ Best, United Water, Barnabas Health, Cohn Resnick, Qualcare Inc., and by these public-spirited organizations committed to informing New Jersey citizens about the issues that matter. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. New Jersey is a leader in solar power, and PSE&G is doing its part. With 24 solar installations in New Jersey, projects that are giving landfills new purpose and turning former brownfields green, solar powers more than our homes and schools and businesses. It powers our economy by creating jobs right here in the Garden State. PSE&G, proud to support New Jersey.